Opportunity cost. Anyone out there ever heard of this term before? Anyone in the investment club? It's often used in the world of investments, but broadly speaking, opportunity cost is the potential benefits you could miss out on by making one decision over another. For example, if you are a footwear company and you just spend $50,000 on upgrading your packaging, the opportunity cost would be that $50,000 that can't be spent elsewhere. If you're a college student and you choose to take an unpaid internship over the summer, the opportunity cost would be the money you could have made if you mowed lawns instead. There are always going to be trade-offs to every decision that we make. Sometimes continuing to do what's familiar and comfortable are the easiest decisions we can make. Heck, that's why McDonald's is so popular around the world. There's very little consumer risk. You know what you're getting. Whether you order a burger in Boston, Berlin, or Beijing, it's all pretty consistent. But if you always choose to do what's familiar and comfortable, you could miss out on, say, that little hole in the wall burger joint down the street that's serving incredible food. <laughs> Back in 2017, I was living out west in California and I was working for Patagonia. And while there are many things I love about working for Patagonia, one of my favorite things was that they allow and encourage employees to take an environmental internship. <coughs> this means that you can take anywhere from a week to a month to go off to pursue a cause or support an environmental nonprofit that resonates with you, and Patagonia will continue to pay your salary. Pretty good perk. After exploring various options, I finally found a small group located in Ecuador that was working hard to reestablish a wildlife corridor to allow jungle species to move naturally throughout their environment. Due to deforestation, the original corridor had been left fragmented, cutting off species and limiting their ability to move in search of food and shelter. The gaps between the fragmented forest segments had recently been reestablished, and now the organization, in addition to educating local farmers about sustainable agroforestry, uh, was trying to survey the forest to see if the species were actually taken back to the uh, original places that they lived. Now, in Ecuador, there are thousands of species of animals. So rather than surveying every one of those thousands of species, they focus primarily on one representative species, the great Mano Aullador, better known as the howler monkey. Now, I, I've always loved primates, and the opportunity to observe these guys, survey them in their natural habitat was too good to pass up on. For two weeks, I'd be walking through the jungle every day looking for troops of howlers. In addition to documenting their precise location, I'd be keeping track of their activity. Were they eating, sleeping, socializing? Uh, was I looking at adults, babies, juveniles, males, females, and recording that information? I was accepted into the organization and given the green light from Patagonia, and before I knew it, I was off on a flight to Quito to spend a fortnight in Ecuador. I spent a full day traveling on a crowded, rundown bus from the capital city to a small town on the coast. Sorry, North Andover is a small town. Where I was going to wasn't even on a map. I had to try to communicate to the bus driver in my level one Duolingo broken Spanish that he needed to stop at near some signpost between two towns in the middle of nowhere. Upon my arrival, I was met after dark by a host and we walked a mile on a narrow footpath into the middle of the jungle. All right, can you guys all humor me for a second? Everyone close your eyes. awoken by the most amazing cacophony of howler grunts. It was 5.30 in the morning and I still couldn't help but laugh, much like many of you. After a hearty but bland breakfast, it was time to begin my first day's trek. 
Now, for those of you that don't know, Ecuador is on the equator. In fact, that's how the country received its name. And in fact, the place I was working was about a mile from the actual equator. If anyone's traveled around the equator, you know that it is hot. If you're walking through the jungle every day, you can be expect to be hot and sweaty. In addition, I was also strongly encouraged to wear long sleeves and pants uh, to protect me from bugs and insects. Even at night, I needed to sleep under a bug net in case something with far too many legs wanted to cuddle with me. So suffice it to say, I was constantly uncomfortable. Now, it may seem obvious, but when you're looking for howlers in the jungle, you have to look up, way up. As I was walking along trails, craning my neck, playing Where's Waldo with all the monkeys, I also had to keep an eye out at eye level for the myriad of spider webs stretched across the trail. Now, I'm not talking about puny Massachusetts spiders either. I'm talking about spiders the size of your fist, the kind nightmares are made of. In addition to looking high for the monkeys and eye level for the spiders, I also had to scan the floor for snakes. Now, boa constrictors and coral snakes were pretty scary, and they were there. But the most frightening by far was a snake called the Fertilance. It's a brown camouflaged viper considered one of the most venomous in all of South America. Now, there's a Fertilance off to the right. Quick sidebar, if you are unfortunate enough to be bitten by a venomous snake. It is not enough to simply rush to a hospital and be administered the correct antivenom. For antivenoms are specific to the type of snake that bit you. So if you get bit, you better hope that you either got a good photo of the snake or can recall in great detail what the snake looked like. And then if you do make it to the hospital in time, you have to hope that the hospital has the correct antivenom for you. I also learned that it's not the adults but the young snakes that are the most dangerous. Not only are they small and hard to spot, but they don't yet have control over their venom. So whereas you could be bit by an adult snake and he could choose not to release his venom, a bite from a young snake is almost always fatal. Oh, and if the spiders and the snakes weren't enough, I also had to keep an eye out for armed poachers that were constantly wandering the jungle. You guys awake yet? Cool. So every day I hiked through the jungle, looking up, looking down, and looking at eye level. The degree of concentration and mental strain that I experienced was beyond anything I had ever done before. It was only once I returned to camp at the end of the day that I could allow myself to relax for just a little bit. But of course, if we got back late after dark, sweaty from the day's walk, it would mean having to take a shower in the dark. And our showers were outdoor, open air showers. I can assure you there's nothing relaxing about taking a shower with a headlamp, looking out for snakes and spiders. In the end, I wrapped up my experience there with a solo hike out of the jungle in the middle of the night to catch a bus going back to Quito. I returned home with a bushy beard, oily skin, and severe sunburns. I was mentally fried, but I didn't regret a moment of it. So what's the point of my story? Why am I telling you this? Is it to tell you how, how brave I was and that you guys all should all be like me? No. I was terrified nearly the, the entire time I was there. I was in a remote part of a foreign country where no one spoke even a lick of English. I regularly imagined what would happen if I was careless for just a second and bitten by something sinister. Despite the anxiety and mental strain, I experienced something incredible. I was able to spend hours every day observing animals in their natural habitat and work to protect their future generations. I made the conscious decision to leave beautiful Marin County, California, all my friends, my soccer team, comfortable bed, hot water, Wi-Fi, cell service, my girlfriend, now wife, all that stuff I chose to leave behind, that was my opportunity cost. But if I chose to stay home and enjoy all those comforts and not take advantage of this opportunity, my opportunity cost would have been much greater. It's so easy to stay in our lanes and do what feels comfortable, 
It's hard to try something new, especially when it's difficult, scary, or makes you feel ridiculous. As you continue your journey here at Brooks and begin to think about life after graduation, I would encourage you to challenge yourself, but not in the ways that you've already proven adept at, but in something that might make you look and feel a little foolish at first. It might mean temporarily stepping away from what your friends are doing. You might be concerned that if you do something different, your friends might judge you. I assure you, if they're true friends, they will support you regardless of what you decide to do. By opening ourselves up to new and unfamiliar experiences, we get to learn more about ourselves and the world around us. Chances are when you look back in 10, 20 years, you won't say, man, I wish I spent more time in my room while I was at Brooks. Be brave enough to scare yourself and be confident enough to potentially look a little silly doing something new. Thank you, guys.